Hey, everybody. Welcome to Battleground Podcast. Um, today, I have a, an amazing guest. I've been excited to talk to him for a while now. His name is Shane Osborne. Shane is a former naval adi- aviator who extended his tour after 9-11 to continue flying combat missions. Shane was assigned to the Fleet Air Reconnaissance Squadron 1, the World Watchers. Um, and Shane kind of had an interesting experience in the air when he collided with a Chinese aircraft. Somehow he managed to safely land the plane, but he, along with 23 of his people who were on that plane, were surrounded by the Chinese military for almost a month. <laughs> Shane. Oh, and now you're the CEO of RWH Energy, which which is a company that is just like kicking ass and taking names and... It's Shane. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you for giving us some of your time. Thanks for having me, Sean. I appreciate it. <laughs> so you got to take me back to the very beginning and tell me about like how you decided to serve your country. I know that flying is something that is is that you've wanted to do since you were young. Yeah. So my mom was. Uh, I was raised by a single mom. She was director of nurses at the Nebraska Veterans Home. So I, after school weekends, holidays, I hung out with vets all the time here in World War II, Korea, war stories, Vietnam, obviously. And so I always wanted to serve. So I didn't go through life wondering what I was going to do. I knew it. By the time I was in second grade, I was writing papers about wanting to fly uh, for either the Air Force or the Navy. And <clears throat> so I, I was lucky enough, you know, I graduated high school in 92 and, and, uh, that was the downturn, right? The Cold War had ended and there wasn't a lot of slots, a lot of things. So I was lucky because we were, you know, we didn't have a lot of money and uh, I was able to get an ROTC scholarship to the University of Nebraska. And so that's that's how it all started. And uh, graduated in 96, was there when the Huskers actually played good football and hopefully they will be again <laughs> soon. And, <laughs> and then uh, headed off to flight school in Pensacola and, and was able to, to live my dream. So... So I was wondering if you went to the Naval Academy, you know, uh, and I, you know, when you pr- I prep for these interviews, like I want to know about you, but I, w- I don't want to know too much because I want to learn during the interview process. And I sure. just thought to myself, like, I wonder if he's a Naval Academy guy, because I'll tell you this, like, no, I, I tried. <laughs> you did what? OK, but tell me. I was nominated. To, the, the, the Senator accent at the time nominated me to West Point and I wanted to fly. I, I didn't even apply to West Point. I don't know what happened with their paperwork, but they nominated me to the wrong academy. So what? I was so heart, heartbroken and wish I could have gone to Annapolis, but it all worked out. Well, so I don't think I could have handled, I don't think I could have handled West Point. I mean, I was an ROTC guy as well. I, I think that ROTC teaches yeah. you some like very important life lessons about being a college student and like getting to where you need to be on time and not having somebody like putting a finger in your chest, telling you to do it. Absolutely. You know, so I think that there's value in that, but I also like when, when outlaw platoon came out, it's like required reading at, at West point and they've got a class on it. So I'll go and meet with those cadets and I see the life that they live, man. And I, I say this often, I don't think I could do it. Like, I, I don't know (laughs) that if I entered the military through an Academy, I don't know if I could have made it. I just don't. It, it was they didn't they didn't get the college life we did. We'll just leave it at that to say <laughs> yeah. the least, right? I mean, that's a, definitely a, a dedication. And I remember because I you know, we had all my best friends in the Navy were academy guys. We all got down to Pensacola to flight school, and they went nuts, right? They were <laughs> they exactly got released from prison. <laughs> they, were, they were having a good time. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Like, so we had at least in the army and in, in in the infantry because I was in the infantry. So we would have. Two kind, two kinds of West Point officers. And by the way, like I, I'm not judging at all. Like I, I love what I've got. Tons of friends that are West Point guys, um, but like, well, now in West Point women as well. But we had people that would graduate that would come out that were super smoked, you know, because they had just done four years of like really tough stuff, you know, four years of, of basic training essentially, and then they'd come into a unit and already already emotionally mentally physically exhausted then you had the other guys that were just super gung-ho and and when they got to their unit i do feel like there was a little bit of like they go to the infantry officer basic course to go to their schools i do feel like there's a little bit of like release there like like they're like you said escaped prisoners or something it's funny (laughs) yeah so you that's a so so you get to pensacola 
and and you're flying. So like, <coughs> tell me, like I'm, I'm not a Navy guy, so I don't know anything about the rigors of your training. Like, tell me, tell me about what flight school was like at Pensacola, and obviously your Navy. So you, you Navy flies rotary wing and fixed wing. So how did you get selected for fixed yep. wing? So so it's it's all it's all about really the needs of the Navy is what it is. So the week you graduate, whatever slots they have, that's what's there. But the the the, the interesting thing about me is I was in a I was actually I went from Pensacola to Corpus Christi, Texas, um, and trained there. And I had been accelerated. They were trying to meet the numbers for the year, so they were flying me twice a day, which was rare. And I got accelerated, but I graduated number one in my class. And the history of the Navy is if you graduate number one, you get your choice. And I wanted to fly fighter jets, right? I was a top gun kid. That was, you know, me growing up, the first yeah. version, you know, that was <laughs> yeah. it. That, I, had, I had the whole roll down, the, the glasses, everything. That's all I'd ever wanted to do since I was five, six years old. And they had a new platform for props that it was a, a King Air that they just introduced. They hadn't put a student through this airplane yet. And so they took four of us as a test to put us through this class. So they took four of us that were all tops of our classes just so it would make sure it would go well. And so I was the first guy, at least that I know of in the history, at least the last, you know, 40 years that graduated number one in his class and didn't get his top choice. So at first I was pretty bummed, but we all know, you know, you get setbacks in life and it ended up working out for the best. So I went through the prop training, went through Jacksonville and when I was in Corpus, after I selected props, I was out with a couple of instructors who were awesome guys, kind of kind of odd, and they kind of pulled <laughs> me aside. So there's only two of these squadrons in the world. Now there's just one. And they were they were like, hey, have you ever thought of going VQ, which is electronic warfare? It's reconnaissance. And and I'm like, I hadn't really thought about it. And they're like, well, we'd like you to consider it. So this is a you know, these two squadrons pretty much hand select who's going to come in, right, and be part of the brotherhood, so to speak, sisterhood, whatever you want to call it. But and so I got interested in it, but um, I speak Spanish. So there's one squadron in Whidbey Island, Washington, VQ1, and then there's another VQ2. It's it's now in Whidbey, but it's in Rota, Spain, like literally on the beach. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm going VQ2. I want VQ2. Guess what? They sent me to VQ1. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I speak Spanish. I'm going to meet my wife over there. This is going to be great. You know, they do all their tours are to like Sudabay, Crete and Europe. And, you know, so Whidbey Island on the West Coast goes to Masawa, Japan, which is the northern tip, the frozen tundra of Japan. Okinawa, Bahrain, you know what I mean? It's not, it's, it's, you know, you're covering the important areas of the world. Don't get me wrong, but as far as places to deploy to, they're, they're not, not near as uh, enticing as Suda Bay and, <laughs> you know, Germany and things like that. But it works out. Like I said, once again, it works out. So the Navy, the Navy took a Spanish speaking naval officer and instead of sending that person to Spain, they sent him to Japan. Yeah, well, we were based with the island is north of Seattle, and it's a fishing town. And it is one of the most beautiful places on earth if you're married. I was not. You've got to drive an hour and a half to see to, to, to even see a female. Like, you got to go to Seattle or Vancouver, which we went to Vancouver a lot. But because this was just a little small fishing town, and they didn't particularly like us there that much. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the local fishermen didn't care for us. So it was uh, it was interesting. It was beautiful. But but uh, not not a place for a young single guy to be. So so take me. So how how did you not? So you didn't get your first choice out of flight school, and and forgive me if the terminology is incorrect, but you didn't get your first yeah, choice after after you left flight school because you were selected for an experimental program or something. Yeah, they they yeah they had a new airframe, a new airplane that they were going to start training and they didn't even have simulators for it. It's just a King Air 200, but they, they wanted to make sure that, you know, it was successful. Right. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it all worked out. I mean, I was promised my, my choice of assignment for taking this on and that didn't, that got changed because of the needs of the Navy are, are more than the needs of Shane Osborne. Right. You just learned it. Yeah. At the time you're upset, but now I look back on, I'm like, yeah, that stuff in the military. And you know what I'm talking about? It's not the good days that built you. It's the bad ones, right? It's not getting what you want. It's getting what what the Navy needs and, and just taking it and understanding that, you know, there is a cause greater than your own 
personal want of wanting to be on the beach in, in Rota, Spain, as opposed to Whitby Island, Washington. And that, that's just, you know, the lo- wonderful life lessons that you just, I don't think you can get outside of the military. Maybe there's other places you can learn some of this stuff, but, you know, going with a crew, deploying halfway around the world and having that responsibility and taking that on, that's just something you're not going to get in the civilian world. I, I completely agree. Not at that age. No, I completely agree with you. How old were you during all this? So, so I literally, I, I graduated college when I was 21. Um, and I graduated flight school in, in literally under two years, which is very rare. Hmm. Um, and so by the time I was a mission commander, I was the youngest mission commander in our squadrons, 70, 80. Well, it's been gosh, 80, 90 years now. God, I'm getting old, but history. So I was like a brand new O three. I just pinned it on. And I was a mission commander in charge of that airplane when my incident happened, uh, in China, I'd only been flying as an aircraft commander for like 90 hours <laughs> when, when the mid air happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was I was pretty young and pretty green. Well, that's crazy because you know you talk you talk about like the needs of the Navy and you know at at that time, I mean because you you extended your tour after nine eleven and this was just when I I, I mean nine eleven was was that moment that I decided to join. Um, so that's what drove me into service. I don't come from a long line of like military generals or something. I was just a kid that saw our country attacked and wanted to get in the fight, but. Yep. Did the operational tempo like because there I feel like we had a very different military prior to September 11th and then 9/11 happens not <laughs> only does it not only did it change our military and the operational tempo but it also changed our country forever I feel like um did you notice a big change in the way of it's more sense of urgency or what did you notice a change before and after 9/11? You know, a, a little bit, but but the unique thing about my squadron BQ one and the BQ two is there was only two of them, and we had to cover. We were collecting intelligence in peacetime and wartime, right? So we do combat missions, but also you got to you know it's the, we had patches that's, that were a, a rip off of Ronald Reagan. It said, "In God we trust; all others we monitor." <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, so we we really had an op tempo where we were deployed, not going out six months and then coming back for a year, year and a half and going, you know, we deployed, we've been deployed 365 days a year in at least two or three locations around the world, my squadron for the last, since World War II. So our op tempo, I'm not going to say it didn't step up a little. It just changed where we were at more because we used to kind of move around. We we started completely, we'll get into this later, but started, you know, after 9-11 started ignoring the Far East and China, which is ridiculous. But the the fact is, is we were always deployed. And that was the cool thing about our squadron. I I went out as a 26-year-old young 03 lieutenant, <clears throat> and I was it. Like, I would deploy with the crew and some maintenance. I was in charge of everything. I had no adult supervision to speak of. There was no commanders there. They were back in Whidbey Island you know, monitoring things. So we'd have a, a site, you know, maybe a crew in Masao, maybe a crew in Kadena, and maybe a, and a crew in Bahrain. And so I was in charge of that crew. I was, you know, you're setting up housing. You're making sure, you know, everything's taken care of, the maintenance of the airplane. So it was a really huge responsibility that was pretty cool and unique. It's amazing the level of responsibility that the United States military gives to 20 somethings. It's, it's, and it's, it's, yeah. I hear story after story of people like, like you, Shane, who have like, like who've, who've just given enormous responsibilities. And like, it's, it's so funny, like as a young platoon leader. So I, in Afghanistan, I was 23, 24 years old. Um, I was a platoon leader in charge of 40 men come back after <coughs> six, leading those guys through combat, right? Like those guys, those men, cause back then in the infantry, it's just men, but like they were, they were it's basically like I was the CEO of a company of 40. Basically, you sign yeah. for everything. You yeah. know, it's it's just you're an executive, essentially. And then I come back. Um, 
after three years of an experience like that, I'm promoted to executive officer of an infantry company, which is 120 people. And the, basically the job description of an executive officer, the second in the chain of command of the company commander is you just basically do everything that the company commander doesn't want to do, which is basically everything that's not leading people in the <laughs> yeah. field. So if you're not de- if you're not deployed, you're doing basically everything. That includes like beans, bullets, logistics. But again, I was 27. And then I took an interim company command at 28 and then a battalion rear detachment command in charge of a battalion at 29. So it's like where and and then you come back to the civilian world, Shane, and I have to admit this is a little bit like shocking to me just how little civilians truly understand how much authority and power that young military officers have. And I often wonder, I mean, because you're the CEO of a successful company now, Shane, but I often wonder it is it do you do you get the same sense that there is a, a huge communication gap or a, a huge gap between you know the the it, type of service it, that it, veterans it have it blows me away it, it blows me away even with people that have like brothers sisters kids in the military just how little they truly know about the military it's so true you know i mean there's the responsibility aspect they all they all <clears throat> they all think we act like we're in boot camp the entire time, like yeah. we're all, you know, <laughs> yelling orders at each other all the time. I'm like, oh no, oh that wouldn't work at all. I'm sorry, but <clears throat> you know, they they think that you know you're. It, it, it's like it's just. It, but you over time, at first, it's shocking. When I got out, I kind of went into a depression. I, I didn't know what to do. I got into the civilian world. And we call everybody vice presidents and stuff. They give everybody all these titles. I know. But it could mean you're like the number two guy at JP Morgan or you're a nobody. Like, I just like, what, what does this mean? Now, I, I strongly believe you treat everybody the same. So it doesn't matter title. That's not what I'm saying. It was just so confusing to me. You know, in the military, you had a rank. You had a you had an MOS or whatever, you know, what you did. And, that, and so it was pretty under, easy to understand where you were in the food chain and what your responsibilities were. And then the civilian world... It, it was it was uh, um, so less structured that I'd been used to that structure. It just took a while to adjust, and I, I kind of find the civilian world pretty easy. There's tough challenges in business, don't get me wrong, but nobody's shooting at you. you yeah, you know what I mean. And that I think that perspective as a veteran helps me chill out when something doesn't the deal doesn't go my way. Right, I lose a big deal that just costs me millions of dollars. Things like that, where most people would be freaking out. It's kind of like, okay, that sucked. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> right. The old saying, em- embrace the suck. Yeah. Right. Just take it, <laughs> breathe it in, smile a little bit, you know, maybe take an evening and have a few and then get back at it. Man, I, I, <laughs> it's so funny. It's amazing. Like you, you being in the Navy, me being in the Army, but our, our experiences are so, so, similar i i just it it never ceases to amaze me how that tends to be the case of of veterans you know um so take me back to the moment where you, those two instructors are are coming to you and saying like have you ever thought of what do you call it like electronic warfare it's called yeah it's called electronic warfare um the, the, the capabilities of that plane, it's getting, it's going to be getting retired here. To, which old, plane, Shane? The e, the EP three, EP EP three. So this is a big four engine prop. When people, I tell people, I flew a spy plane. It, this isn't an SR seventy one. It's not some <laughs> sexy Mach one. This is a slow. We called it the Sky Pig. Um, <laughs> it, it's got stuff hanging off everywhere. Uh, you know, if we go faster than two hundred fifty knots. Things start airplane, the antennas and stuff. So we were literally limited to 250 knots. It's the size of a 737, like a Southwest jet. So it's it's a big converted airliner, is what it is. So, <coughs> hot. So you first of all, you could totally and you should tell people that you fly SR 71s. I mean, like uh, you, I think <laughs> you get with your experience, like your Sorry, experience, I got horrible like horrible allergies. I keep coughing. Apologies. Oh God, Shane, it's okay. It's okay. Um, but you should totally tell people that because your job just you, the job that you did just sounds super cool. And also the the Sky Pig is is like the worst nickname ever for an airplane. Sounds ridiculous. Oh, this thing is uh it it's not pretty. But it was a, it, we had a lot of cool gear on that airplane. We well, can what, do a lot of you know, the crew of twenty four people, that's a big crew. That is a huge you know, 
you know, that's yeah. We had we had all we covered the full spectrum of intelligence gathering on that thing. So yeah. Was, so it, so you know, e- explain it, explain to people what like the mission was, the stuff that you can talk <coughs> about, like because sure. you know you hear it's a spy plane, but like and and I I, I I as a military guy want to ask you about the capabilities of the plane, but of course you might not be able to talk about that. But like, what what was the mission when you say electronic warfare? The, sure. The, the the mission varied depending on if it was wartime or peacetime. Peacetime, we're just trying to figure out how the enemy operates, right? So we're, we're listening, we're watching, we're detecting all types of different spec from everything from communications to signals to everything to just see how they communicate, how they work. You know, we 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 didn't fly over. Obviously, we stayed out in international airspace, but you know, they would react in different sectors differently depending on where you were at, like on the coast of China, right? They, the southern area operated completely differently than the northern. And so I'm not, I don't want to get too specific, but that was, and then in wartime, we, we the, the fighter jets didn't go in if us or we had, there's a rivet joint, RC-135 in the Air Force. Yes. We had to be airborne because we would, we would let them know if they were about to get shot. <laughs> Basically, I'm just, I'm paraphrasing, I'm, I'm, but we knew if the enemy knew where, where the fighters were. So we would also locate things on the ground, right? We could pinpoint the location. So not only were we listening, we knew where you're at. So like the beginning of Afghanistan, they, for some reason, thought if it was nighttime, they could do whatever the hell they wanted, right? It, we're talking literally the very first months yeah. of, the, of, of the war. And it was like, guy, you know, and, and they, they would be, get chatty Kathy on the radios while they were driving around in their convoys, you know. So we'd sit in and listen in with our, you know, linguists and, and, and had to make that call. Good guy, bad guy, right? And then uh, you'd call it in and give them the location and we'd say, here, hit this spot and they'd hit it. Okay, so this is, this is fascinating to me because – so we would, we <coughs> would have intel passed to us from like rivet joint or, or aircraft like yeah. you – yeah, and, that was us. And by the way, we never knew what the hell that was. I mean, I'm just learning about it now. I mean, I've been out for damn yeah. near over 10 years and I still like because we would get this intel passed down from us and, and, and we would we would like take the intel that was passed from these airplanes and because, you know, pass on like what they were saying and where you thought they would be. And I think oftentimes it's, it's mm-hmm. they can one kilometer by one kilometer area, or sometimes it's even more specific than that. And we would, we would take those locations in those eight digit grid coordinates and plot them on our map and say, Oh man, like this, yeah, this is the enemy. And because this is a historical ambush site and they must be there planning an attack. So what we would do once we got that intel is we would take our howitzers and we would fire harassment and interdiction fires on those sites after we got the intel from you to let the enemy know that, like, we know where they are and we can yeah. monitor what they're saying. I mean, that's fascinating that you can do that from that high up in the air. We had people on the ground that that, you know, I don't think, by the way, this I don't think I'm disclosing anything that's that's secret here because. The enemy wow. knew the enemy had their own comsec, the communication security. They would say, like, for example, yeah. like woods, they uh, move the wood from here to there. They were talking about wood meant rockets. So they had their own communication security <laughs> because they knew that we were monitoring what they were saying. Yeah. It took them a while to figure it out. They made it was it was it was not uh, not smart on their part. Those first probably six to eight months of the uh, war. I, I'll tell you that even. When I was there in 2006, this was five years after you're talking about, we would still meet remote tribes in, in like in Eastern Afghanistan that had never seen an American. And I mean, there's no TVs, there's no electricity, there's no running water, no. there's no cable, they get no news. Like, and I mean, like, if you want to go back to a time when Christ walked the earth at an AK 47 and a pickup truck and an ICOM radio, and that's Afghanistan. And like, <coughs> these people, like, we would. We would lace targets for fixed wing aircraft or close air support for JDAM or something. And they were think that like they, they they thought that we were like wizards, like we were calling this stuff down from heaven sure. on them. And I'm not even exaggerating. They they thought it was magic. No, I it's a it's amazing how how far removed they are from modern society. You just don't even think it could exist. Uh, it's it, like it's, it's truly it. We're on the ground in Afghanistan and it was the closest thing to real life. You know, the Flintstones meet the Jetsons. 
you know, yeah. uh, because sure. they, they would see stuff. It, they, we would get out of our trucks, you know, in our helmets, our, sun, our glasses, our ballistic glasses, gloves covered from head to toe and armor. Like, we'd look like we were some damn alien, like oh, climbing I'm, out of a spacecraft yeah. or something, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, it's crazy. But it's fascinating to me to hear that. How how are you able? How do you know? So we get intel from you. Right. And we know that it's coming from higher. That's basically how that's basically how we know. But where how do you know where to look? Well, I mean, you've got you've got historical stuff going on. You've got certain uh, methods uh, and, and you're scanning, too. Right. You're not always precise. So you, that's why we had such a big crew. Right. <laughs> we, yeah. were, we were monitoring a lot of different channels. When I was I'd be up flying, I would have probably. 10, 12 different conversations going on and one, some in the left ear, some in the right, because I'm monitoring the back what's going on while I'm flying the airplane because I was the mission commander too. I wasn't just the aircraft commander. And so you're, you're hearing all these reports and then you're hearing your, your folks in the back talking to each other as they're trying to, we're trying to verify, right? We don't just go, okay, we found some people, Yeah, <laughs> you know, we gotta, we gotta make sure that they're bad guys and not just some, you know, poor bastard trying to get the hell out of there. You know, at the start of the war, you know, because a lot of people were just running to Iran and running to Pakistan to get out of town. They didn't want, you know, and so you had to make that determination. So it took a lot of different. We didn't want to just go off of one source. We'd want to make sure we're verified. And that's why I said in the beginning, it was just crazy what they were saying on the radios and stuff. You know, it was like they were just oblivious. Hmm. Um, and then they, they started to. You know, like you said, use some ComSec on it and, and, and get a little better about it. But but those first few months, it was like, I can't believe they just said that on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, okay, they, they, that's that's pretty convincing to me. <laughs> We're moving Osama bin Laden to this address. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, So what altitude do you fly at? Oh, geez. We're, we're at like 24,000 feet. The plane has so many holes in it from all these dishes and stuff <laughs> attached to it. We couldn't pressurize and get any higher. We the, now the rivet joint was a, is a seven oh seven, so they could get up in the thirties. They they could cover a lot more ground because the higher you are, the more electrons are hitting the airplane, right? So the the larger area you can cover and monitor. Does that make sense? No, no. You know, that's you. you <laughs> well, want the, well I, you know, the high, it's it's all about the curvature of the Earth, right? So the higher you are, the more it's going to hit you. More electrons are going to hit your airplane. More electrons. Yeah, and, and radio signals, uh, radar, everything. See, right? you're wasting. So this you this are, is why you fly. You know, I'm just a, I'm just a simple gr- ground pounding <laughs> grunt. Like <laughs> electrons. Uh, don't kid yourself. I'm, I'm not that bright. <laughs> Okay, so you got to tell me, you got to tell me, so I, you had like, you gained international recognition. I mean, what, uh, when your, when your spy plane crashed into a Chinese aircraft, was it a MiG? Yeah, it was a J-8. It was an indigenously produced it, it, uh, fighter plane, but a big one. Kind of like, the, it looks a lot like the old F-4 Phantom. It was that size. So it was a big, old Cold War era fighter jet. So we monitor constantly, like I said earlier, you know, all of our friends and foes, quite frankly, we, you know, and <clears throat> we were used to, you know, we go off the coast of China, but when this, this occurred, this incident occurred April 1st, 2001. So it was prior to September 11th and uh, Bush had just taken office. And as you know, th- those guys were all hawkish as hell to say the least. Right. I so the did, tensions yes. with China went up. With Jang, is a man quick, right? So we went from doing a few missions to a lot of missions off of China. You know, we do one or two a week to five days a week, right? And it was pissing them off. We would stay off the coast. We were in, we were you know operating in international airspace. Don't get me wrong, but it just you know no, just like we freak out when the Russians come over near Alaska, right? It's like no, they can operate there. That's international law. Stop making it a big deal. It's it's when it's unprofessional that it becomes a big deal, right? So. They had a particular uh, squadron leader that was getting more and more aggressive. And like I said, I was a brand new mission commander. This was my first deployment as a mission commander. You know, uh, I had maybe 90 hours uh, as a commander. And so, which is not a lot when you fly 
10, 11 hour missions. You know what I mean? So just to put it into perspective, 90 yeah. hours is, you know, I'd done some training and, and maybe six or seven missions, yeah. right? Not much. And, uh, and so he was getting more and more harassing. And, you know, they, this had gone on with the Russians in the Cold War where they'd intercept and come up and thump you, which means they, you know, they go underneath the airplane and go vertical right in front of you and make you fly through their jet wash, which shakes the hell out of the airplane. We were actually used to that. But the Russians knew how to fly. They were trained in formation training. Back then, the Chinese didn't even teach form flying. They've come a long way. This is 2001. They've come a long way. Trust me. But back then, they didn't even train in their own squadrons flying formation off of each other. So now they're coming up trying to harass us, and they're flying off our wing trying to fly form off a slow plane doing like 180 knots at 24,000 feet. Well, fighter jets aren't built to fly that slow that high, so they're unstable. And that was really the problem. So in the weeks leading up to this, he'd become more and more harassing. They'd come out usually with two, sometimes four, but most of the time two fighter jets. And they'd just sit out there and we'd, we'd, we'd uh, exchange uh, hand signals <laughs> through the windows, <laughs> stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it was, it was so crazy. I look back at now, that was – it started to become everyday life. Like literally, I'm unarmed, flying a slow lumbering prop – in the middle of the ocean, and I've got a fighter jet with missiles on it threatening me, you know, on a daily basis. And so this day, um, we were literally done with the mission. We were like 10 minutes from going home. We get, inter- we get, uh, we get instructions that we're going to be intercepted. And so I said, okay, we're staying on because that's when you collect good intel, right? They're talking to their base. You're figuring out what's going on. You're going to see their tactics, etc. So instead of just running, I stay. That's, you know, that's my call. Some would say that was aggressive. I don't think it was. I think it was my damn job. And so we stayed and this guy came up and this time, instead of staying off my wing, like 40, 50 feet, he came up and he was in between my props, like three feet away. And I'm like, what in the hell? So I'm calling back to my navigator going, check our position. Cause I thought we we're screwed up and we're in their airspace. Do you know what I mean? I mean, this was like, this ain't good. So I immediately called back going, you know, nav to Regina Kaufman. She was, we called her the pocket nav. She was about five foot tall. So we called her pocket nav. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and she's like, no, we're way out. We're not even. And I've said, okay. So he comes up twice. And one time he stalled underneath me, lost controlled flight, fell off. So they turned away, and I'm like, okay, they're turning away. It's time to go home, right? And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is – I knew that right then the president would know about this in about two minutes. That's how serious this was. So I'm turned around, headed towards Okinawa. I'm starting to speed up to go home because when we're on station, we go as slow as we can to save gas so we can stay there longer, right? So I'm speeding up. I got the autopilot on. All of a sudden, I get a call from the back, and they said, here they come again. And I'm like, what in the hell is this guy doing? Because they usually came once, stayed a while, messed around and left, right? Now, this was the third intercept of this flight, which for me, it never happened. I'm not saying it never happened before, but not not to me. And so the third time he came in, he came from behind us too fast, and he tried to slow down by pitching his nose up, and he went right into my left prop. So where his tail you know, meets his fuselage of the airplane right there, my left, far left engine cut him in half. It's like, I, the best way to describe it is if you're a redneck like I am. It's like, it's like doing 100 miles an hour down a gravel road and hitting walk for it. That's the best way I can describe it. If you've ever done, dri- driven gravel roads, you know at that point you're just along for the ride. You hope it stays yeah. on the road. And so as it cut his plane in half, my nose flipped violently to the left, obviously, because my wing had just been impacted. His tail broke off, tore through my aileron, which turns the airplane, tore a hole through that, and then his nose broke apart, hit my nose, and tore my nose completely off of the airplane. And next thing I know, we're inverted in a dive. We were, we were in an inverted dive for almost two miles. Are you kidding me? You know, the, the planes exploded, and there's, you know, I, I had, I, and I just thought, we're dead. And I look down, I'm looking, you know, I'm looking up at the ocean, and, and I, I see his plane, half of it, the front fuselage, with like a two block flame bursting out of the back of it, you know, as he's going straight towards the ocean. And I was like, man, he's, you know, he's going quick. And I realized we were falling at almost the same rate. You know, that's my reference point. I saw him punch out. He literally asked for permission to eject. 
this is the kind of <laughs> government. Work. This guy's going down in flames, and he's calling his his commander to ask for permission to eject. Oh my god! It was an, it's insane. That probably I probably should have just said that, but I did. Um, anyway, so we're we, we're falling at this rate, and I'm like, I'm trying to get the plane right side up. And I finally got it right side up, and we're still in a nosedive. But I knew I just had this. It was taking full right airline, right rudder to hold the plane up. But I just had this feeling of don't pull, don't pull, don't pull. I, I, and it was God, plain and simple. And I'll tell you why in a minute. So we started out at 24,000 feet. I got the plane somewhat out of the dive at about 7,000 feet. So that's a long, that's a long drop. I, and, I, I you know, can't even, had I can't believe it. Decom- we had explosive decompression, so there's wind screaming through the airplane. There's cables that were torn off when the nose was departed. They're slapping the, the windscreen. My left engine, that prop is out there. It, it just had cut him in half. And so now that engine had obviously failed, and the prop went flat. So it's out there windmilling. It's like t- tying a parachute to your left wing, aerodynamically speaking. It's causing that kind of force. So I'm holding this, and I'm a big guy. It, took, it tore my shoulder apart holding this airplane up. It took us 35 minutes. And so I, I knew we had specific instructions, depending on the target country, of what we're supposed to do in an in-flight emergency. And back then, we pulled our carriers into China still. Like, there was a lot of controversy later. I said, oh, why don't you crash into the ocean? I'm like, I had specific directive orders to destroy the equipment and land. And that's what we did. So now the crew in the back, they've been pinned to the floor in this inverted dive. And now I'm calling back to them saying, one, get your parachutes on. Two, activate the destruction checklist so they're opening up the emergency exits over the wings and they're chopping up the the gear and chucking it out in the meantime the other fighter jet rolled on our sticks and asked for permission to shoot us down and they thank god told him no and so you know i'm trying to hold this plane up i've got two of my four engines damaged no nose and my my tail was really acting weird. I couldn't get the forces out. I had to hold force onto it. Usually you can trim it out. I'm, I don't want to be too technical, but when I when I landed and later inspected the airplane, I, there's a wire that goes from the very tip of the of the roof of the cockpit to the tail. The front had torn off and it had wrapped around my tail. Okay, so I had a wire jammed into my elevator, which makes the plane go up and down. Not good. Well. <clears throat> Later, when I was back, the people that took the airplane apart, one of the engineers, I was getting ready to go. I was actually on, on an instructor. I had two students going to fly. This is months later. Comes out. He says, hey, Lieutenant Osborne, I took apart your plane. I said, great. I, I'm going to go fly. Can we talk to you back? He goes, you know, you always complain about that wire on your tail. I said, I said yeah. He goes, yeah, when we unraveled it, the elevator fell off the airplane. <laughs> that wire wrapped around my tail was what was keeping me up in the air. So we, we, we're calling Maydays. They're not answering us. We have to come in, and I didn't want to fly over the top of the city because this plane's disintegrated, and I didn't want to kill a bunch of people if we came apart, so I had to maneuver. Now, I knew where every air base is on the east coast of China. We'll just leave it at that, right? So I knew where I was going, and it was the exact air base where these guys were out of. So <clears throat> we came around, but, but by then I lost my altitude, so I didn't have any airspeed. They were torn off. So all we had was the navigator calling out our GPS speed, but my flaps were damaged. I had two engines out of the four. And I didn't even know if my landing gear were going to come down because he'd hit my nose. I didn't know if my nose gear was going to come down. So I couldn't dump fuel. So I'm like 25,000 pounds overweight. So we ended up touching down at over 180 knots because the plane wouldn't fly any slower. You normally land at about 115. So now we're overweight. <laughs> we're land, you know, and so... It took everything I had to get that plane stopped before it went off the end of the runway. And so, you know, you touch down and you're like, holy crap, the good Lord just stepped in, clearly. This wasn't this wasn't mine and the other pilot skill, right? You know, the engineers, everybody did a great job, but there's more involved here. And so, you know, you're you're just your adrenaline is pumping as you you know it exactly. It's just it's like being in a fire, you know, the adrenaline is maxed out. And now I'm looking around and I I, I pull over to the side of the runway and up comes two troop carriers and a bunch of guys with AK 47s <laughs> surrounding my airplane. I'm like, oh, shit. I wish I was just going to the officer's club to have a drink right now, but now I got to deal with this shit, you know? And so we made sure we were destroying any of the last radios before we got a satellite call out. And, uh, and then I, you know, I didn't want to get anybody killed. So I, I took everybody off the airplane at gunpoint. And then Alan started, Sean. That was. 
the, the flying I've been well trained for, um, you know, we pulled it off. We, the crew did a great job, but now, you know, the interrogations began and they isolated me because I was the commander. So they basically kept me awake in a stool for about eight days trying to break me. And, uh, a funny side story is that I hid it. I hid it from the Navy, but I've had sleep apnea all my life. And so back then, I, I when I got tested when I got out of the Navy, they said you're sleeping about an hour a day. <laughs> That's all the sleep you're getting. You're functioning. We don't know how you're doing it, but here, here you go. Here's a here's a CPAP, and I've had one since I was like 32 years old. Now. <laughs> it's crazy. It's really great when you're in the dating scene. Hold on, honey. Let me put on my CPAP. Yeah. Uh, but the. Uh, uh, thank God I've been married now, but, but, uh, so, so they, they were very, um, intense, right. And people think, Oh, were you really scared? What you knew they would, I'm like, this is the Chinese. They're going to do whatever they want. I later found that the military cut off communications with Beijing said, we got this. We'll call you later. Literally, which I didn't know at the time. And I, and I wondered, cause we then got moved later when that broke. But for a while, basically the, the, the Chinese Navy, their commander said, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear from you guys. I'm going to, I'm going to break these guys. And so that, you know, that changes your job, not from just surviving, but my job was to protect my crew. And so no matter what they threatened me with, no matter what they said, I <clears throat> knew that, you know, it was my job to protect them. And that's, that's what I did. So um, the crew stuck together. I was isolated. They went on a three day hunger strike. So they were able to at least see me at meals. And, they knew they were going to have to kill me if they were going to get to my crew. So I, I'm very proud of the fact that 90% of the crew, except the officers, they went through one interrogation for 20 minutes with two of them in a room. So you got your buddy next to you. And so that's about the most, you know, the best accomplishments of all that. It wasn't the aviation. It was protecting the crew and making sure everybody, you know, got home intact. How – I have so many questions. I've never heard – look, I've been in some – crazy ass situations combat situations life and death situations more firefights than i can possibly recount but i have never heard anything like this ever and it's like something that you'd see out of a movie you know i i mean honestly i how did you, you know, know the funniest thing is is i i did the book sean right um lion's gate was gonna do the movie they wrote a script and the chinese killed it <laughs> they pulled it because they they fund Hollywood. Yeah, ex- well, that's, that's exactly right. I'm, that I is, still can't go there. They still consider me a murderer and a spy. That is complete. That is complete bullshit. That 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 Hollywood Lionsgate that they killed this project. First of all, oh, they would deny it, but I got I got told by somebody who knew. Well, of course, I, I mean, it makes it makes all, we hear you hear the stories all the time. So, of course, <laughs> uh, you know, the people that are watching and listening to this to this program are going to they, they it's complete. They get it. Of course, this is how it is. Yeah. China. Yeah. And, and that's why that's why a lot of these Hollywood production studios like are afraid to push back on China because like that's a significant portion of their revenue, you know, uh, but what, oh, absolutely bullshit. I I. How did you? How did you know? Not you got twenty three people on the aircraft. How did you know? Not you said it was a god thing, but how did you know not to pull? Said you were, you know. I just, I my gut said we were in such a heavy dive. I was just like, I was looking out at the horizon. I'm like, I got, I got some altitude too, and I was just thinking, you know, the air gets thicker the lower you are, so you get more control of the aircraft. When you're up high, the air's thin, so, so aircraft are more unstable. And I was just like, I, I'm, I got to get down lower, right? I got to get down lower. And I don't, I don't really, you know, it was just, I don't know what it was, but, but I just had this feeling of don't, don't force it, you know, just let this thing come out. You know, you're right side up, you're coming out slow, but I took it really slow. I mean, could I maybe pull, you know, if the t- tail wasn't damaged, I could have probably got out of that dive by 13, 12,000 feet, but something just, my gut just said, don't, don't force it. You got, you got plenty of altitude. And I knew I knew I was going to have to go into China. People are like, well, could you make it back? I'm like, good lord, this thing <laughs> was in bad shape. I was to say the least. So I was going to ask you, were you able to talk to your command throughout all of this? We we yeah they they called back, and it was it was it was it was the middle of the night there, and so it was just a watchstander in Hawaii, 
and this poor guy is getting a call <laughs> and it was on April fir- it was on April 1st like so so a few people are like is this some stupid April yeah. fools joke <laughs> oh god which i don't do April fools fools <laughs> jokes my all my family knows don't do the April oh, fools joke shit with Shane. it's got to be some, what is some it. some private or something right it has to be some private like yeah I, just a guy he's taking this call and he said to our guy he goes can you can you hold for about five minutes? I need to call again. We're like we can't hold. We're we're at gunpoint here. You know what I mean? We got to shut down. So you know, I'm sure that you know that guy had a rough day to say the least getting that call right. But we got the information out. We let everybody know we were alive. Um, you know, and then and then had to just destroy the radio. Uh, okay, so y- you told me also that your crew were they were throwing radios out of the plane as you're crashing. The crypto gear, the crypto yeah, gear in the yeah. air. Yeah, we have metal suitcases, and they took an axe and they punch a hole in it and throw it to the bottom of the ocean. You know that you're never going to find. How, that. Well, and if you do, it'll be dissolved. Well, right. But how the hell are they doing this when they? I mean, because presume I, I don't. I've never been in a situation like once this. I got the plane straight and level. You know what I mean? It was still rough, but we were we were upright. It was after we were out of a dive, obviously, that they started doing this. We had it was 35 minutes from impact to when we landed. That's crazy. So it wasn't quick. How did you, uh, how did you land yeah. this thing? I, uh, you know, I we good crew. The plane held together. I can't believe that thing held together. The damage it took. That thing's a truck. And uh, you know, if people said, "Well, what if it would have been a female pilot?" And I had three females on board who did awesome. Uh, one was. Uh, one was my flight engineer, one was the navigator, and one was the one of the heads of Intel in the back. And and uh, you know, I, I I said female or not, I said there's ninety percent of the pilots I know wouldn't have been strong enough to hold it. The force it took. I mean, I back then I benched like three eighty. That's insane. I was a truck. You know what I mean? And it tore my shoulder apart holding it. I, uh, I mean, that much force for that long. I mean, that's total adrenaline, uh, right? You know, those strengths uh, I do. What you can do, yeah. and, right? but, but you know, how long can the adrenaline last? Right. And so, you know, I obviously had my co-pilot helping me hold it. It wasn't just me initially it was, but then, and my co-pilot's a big dude too. So, I mean, it, it was a, it was a, it was, the, it was the right crew in the right place. And, and, and I, and I, I don't say it lightly. I mean, God stepped in and, uh, I made some deals sitting sitting in a Chinese prison with, with the good Lord, and I think I've helped him. I um, I'm absolutely stunned by this. I I, I mean I, I remember this happening, by the way. Um, and I, I I couldn't believe it then, but to hear it personally from you now, it's just it's I can't, I've never heard anything like this. And so you get off the aircraft, and there are there. Are, Chinese troops with AK forty sevens. I mean, those AK forty sevens are what at the high ready. Are they? Are they? Are they aimed? Are they aimed at you? A few of them were. A few of them were, and then they pulled them back. And they and they they their commander came up. They were as scared that we were there as we were. You know what I mean? They didn't expect us either. They're like, "What the hell's going on?" Right? And so the commander came up that was there, and he spoke English. Um, and he asked me if we were armed, and I, I assured him there were no weapons because we weren't allowed to have weapons. That's international law. For reconnaissance aircraft, we're not allowed to be armed, and so I assured him we had no weapons. And then, and then they they didn't they weren't pointing them at us anymore. But they were they were clearly wanted us off. When we were in the airplane, I left the engines running so they couldn't come up. Right, you're not going to walk up to an airplane with a prop. Stand. Right, right. And and that was why we were getting the calls out. But that was when they were getting really nervous, and they were. And I'm like, I don't need some young shithead popping off and shooting shooting one of us. Right, we, you know, there's just there's no point in it. And so, um, you know, then when it was time to get off the airplane, I assured him, assured him we weren't armed. And, and uh, you know, so they took us in a, and put us in a bus. And then it's so funny because I, it, you know, you, just, you remember things and you forget some stuff. But I thought we'd walked somewhere and I found out later that we took a bus. And, you know, just little things when your mind's just at a, at a heightened sense, yeah. so to speak. And so, you know, those interrogations, they read like an hour of how horrible America is and how I'm going to jail the rest of my life. And we could be, you know, they can't guarantee that we're going to make it out of here alive and crap like that, you know? And, and, uh, so you kind of, after days get, you know, get used to it, you know? So then they'd like, they'd p- take me back to a room and they'd let me fall asleep. And then they'd startle me and wake me back up. Right. And after a few days, you get pretty freaking jumpy. You know what I'm talking about when you're in the field and you're exhausted, you know, trigger happy you get, so to speak, yes. like anything startles you. 
So I had this guard that wore these taps on his shoes and he'd walk around my room and hock loogies and spit them in the trash can and walk around on taps and just piss me off. And I remember like day six, I'm hallucinating. I'm playing cards with my dead grandma, talking to her openly. And, and uh, he woke me up. And, and like I said, they let me sleep for like 15 minutes and, and then, you know, jolt you. And uh, he woke me up. And I remember thinking, because I had my own room, because I was isolated from my crew. And I was like, there was a closet in this room. And I was like, I'm going to go behind this little bastard. I'm going to break his neck and I'm going to hide him in that closet. And I hope they don't find him <laughs> until I get out of here. And that is when I scared myself because I was ready to kill this guy. And that would have not been good as we all know. You know what I mean? And I was like, what in the fuck are you doing? You need to get your shit together. I, and so I just, I prayed hours. Anytime I wasn't being interrogated and while I was interrogated, I'd pray. And then when they talk to you because you're losing your mind, instead of trying to answer them with bullshit, I would start talking about Kentucky Fried Chicken and could they go get us some food and I'd be willing to pay for it. You know what I mean? I just totally, or I would talk about, they'd be like, what about your systems? And so I'd start talking about the pedo tube, which is what tells you how fast the airplane's going. You know, so they'd start taking notes like they were getting some secret crap. And I, I'm told, and you know, after a while, I think they started to respect, I know they did at the end because the two commanders, the two main interrogators came up and did picks with me when, once they were releasing me saying, you clearly care about your people, right? Because I wasn't, they were going to have to kill me and they knew it. And so once you threaten somebody, like they're saying, you know, they, they, they would blow smoke in my face and I hate cigarettes. I hate them. So that's what one of the things they do to keep me awake is they, 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 their guards would take breaks and just sit there and smoke and blow smoke in my face. But they, you know, they made these threats. And once you don't follow through with those threats, then I knew it was a mental game and I owned it. Right. You know, you, you say you're going to take me away and put me in a jail and you don't. You say you're going to, you know, you're going to threaten to hit me. You're going to do this if I don't start talking and you don't do it. Well, now, now the advantage is mine, so to speak. So they tried changing tactics and then I'll stop like day nine. So the rest of the crew hadn't been interrogated. They're just bored in their rooms with a roommate, right? Freaking out, but at least not being interrogated. So they tried doing a, a, a crew interrogation after we ate. And we're sitting there, and I have my head, my other number two officer, and then my senior enlisted guy, a guy named Nick Mellows, uh, who is, I was 26. At that time, he'd been in the Navy 28 years. He's a Greek dude, larger than life. Um, you would love this guy. And they're reading all this stuff that they've been reading to me every time they interrogate me about threatening, you know. And, and Nick Mellows has a, a, a temper to say the least, right? He's a big Greek dude. He's bald headed. He talks two inches from your face. Every other word's the F word, <laughs> but everybody loves him. I mean, he, he can insult the hell out of you and you don't care. And so he's getting pissed, right? He's starting to get mad. I'm like, oh, I can't have him losing his temper because if he loses it, this could be bad, right? So they're reading this and he's, he's starting to get physically angry. So I, we're sitting at a table. So I just reach my right hand down and sit next to me. And I start rubbing his inner thigh. <laughs> <laughs> and he's looking at me like, what the hell? You know what I mean? I started rubbing his inner, inner thigh, giving him a few grazers. And he chilled out after that. He was like, what the hell? We still laugh about that to this day. <laughs> I, had to, I had to de-escalate the situation. I can't. I mean, what is going through your mind during those eight days in captivity? I mean, how are you? I mean, you start. You know, it, tell me about the the slow deterioration of what that was like. Because I know, you know, you, you start strong and they're throwing all these threats at you. But over time, yeah, you know, you're sleep deprived. Your mind starts playing tricks on you. You start like, like you said, you start like yeah, losing it's, your it's, mind. It's a mental, it's a mental strength game. And it was horrible, but it taught me everything I needed to know about myself, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was intense. Did you ever It was 12 days and it was a long time. I thought we were going to be there a hell of a lot longer. 12 days it is a long time. I, that's, 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 it is a long time. I was telling you, I said, go sit in a closet in the dark for six hours and then come talk to me. You know, don't even have to have anybody messing with you. Just go sit in a closet for six hours. You can't sleep. Stay awake and just sit there. Do they, did and you then, go through you know, any like seer training? Like we had, we had, yeah, we had been, we all have to go through seer training and that was some of the best. I remember taking that training and they're, you know, they put you out in the cold and we were, we almost got canceled. It was the middle of winter in Maine, Brunswick, Maine. 
and they had a couple guys that that got hypothermia, and then they capture you, right? And they literally smack the shit out of you. They put you in a box. They interrogate you. You know, they do stress positions, and and uh, and uh, I got hit pretty good. It messed my job for a couple years. A big dude popped me, um, and I mouthed off. I was being a dipshit young idiot, and uh, it, you know, so he let me know who was in charge real quick. And I remember at the time going, this is just some bullshit military harassment training. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the one thing they did was they did, I'm not going to get into the techniques, but they do certain things where you screw up. And they're like, they did something and they, they said, okay, you need to sign in here. So I signed in, right? And then later they showed me, it was like a confession. It was a piece of, you know, it was folded in a way that I didn't know it, but it was a signed confession, Right. And it, I'll never forget it because it embarrassed the shit out of me. Hmm. I mean, and uh, you know, it was one. I just, I just read John McCain's book before that, and so as, as this is all going on, I'm like, hey, this ain't your six, this ain't your eight. And I always just thought to myself, the blood's not going to go thin on my watch because, um, <clears throat> and 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 I have very mixed feelings on John McCain P- politically. I'm not a fan, but he had a he had a saying that that I always remembered. And he said, it's all about when you get home and you're looking at your buddy across the bar, knowing you did it right. Does that make sense? Yes. It's, 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 it's about being able to live with yourself. I, that's, it makes complete sense to me. I mean, all that we were focused on, like all the politics and the, you know, the bullshit foreign policy stuff, like when you're in, you know, boots on the ground in Afghanistan, all that stuff goes away. And the only yep. thing that matters is making sure that you don't let the person next to you down. And so I com- Absolutely. completely get it. And, oh, and for just so people are tracking, SEER is survival, evasion, resistance, and escape, correct? Like, it's been a long time. Yeah, it's POW training. Yeah. They teach you how to try to get away, and they teach you how to act in the in the code of conduct if you get caught. Did you did – you- well- Harken back to any of that training? I mean, sometimes, sometimes, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say sometimes it just absolutely. happens like unconsciously. You just do. Um, yeah, and I in the in the you know I would I would protect my crew anyway, but half that crew were special assigned folks that that are brilliant, but not necessarily the same military training. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. You know, they're linguists. They're they're these are not these are not Marines. <laughs> yeah, I had a Marine on board, but these are not you know. You know what I'm saying? So I was really careful. And the the funny thing about it is usually when I'm flying off of Vietnam, I got a bunch of Vietnamese descent Americans in the back, right? Or, you know, Iran, I got some Persians on board, right? We we only had one Asian person on this airplane, and he was the in-flight technician. So he was Filipino. They were convinced he was Chinese. They kept screaming at him in, in Chinese, and he didn't speak a word of it. So it was one of those, the the you know, the diversity of the crew – was there, but it wasn't, there was there were no Chinese people on board. So they couldn't figure out who did what. And so that really helped us in being able to just kind of keep them at arm's distance. So they couldn't just focus on the four Chinese guys or gals on the airplane and start getting after them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh God, that is, that is crazy. I, so how did you find out that it was over and, and you were going to make it home? Like, how did that, how did that news break to you? How were you told they did a group. They did a group meeting. They read the whole thing that you're you're a spy and you're a murderer and you're you know blah blah blah. And in the, in the spirit of you know goodwill, you'll be released. And I was kind of like, don't get your hopes up. This we don't know yet. And then um, they did all the picks. You know, the that was when I knew when the when my head interrogators that had been putting the screws to me for twelve days came up and were taking individual pictures with me. I was like, okay. And so then we got out and we had probably a, I don't know, four mile drive to the airport. So they put us in vans. They had a soldier or a police officer every four feet on both sides of the road, the entire trip to the airport. We pull up and they wouldn't let a U.S. military aircraft come get us. So it was a continental jet. And at the top of the, at the top of the ladder is my skipper, my commanding officer, Mike Pagliarulo Pags, who's like six foot five, <laughs> mustache German dude. You know, he's standing up there just grinning. And I'm like, oh. And one of my favorite picks is the pick they took. We all got our own seats on the airplane, open rows, right? We're tired. The second I got the call, we were in international airspace. <clears throat> my body shut down. 
shut down. There's a great pic that I love that I've got framed where my eyes, my face is just, you know, like I was finally safe. And so, you know, you flip the defenses off and body needs some rest to say the least. Uh, they, they found me, they were doing debrief. I was said I was going to the restroom apparently. And they found me like four floors away roaming around this building. <laughs> I didn't know where the hell I even was, you know? So it was, it was a great day. And the funny thing is at the time, I didn't even know if I'd ever be able to tell the story. I didn't know if anybody knew what we did was so secret that I couldn't even tell people in the Navy what I did, you know? So it was, I, I knew it was obviously public when we landed in Guam and there was all these TV crews and I was like, okay, life just changed. I was literally going to go fly for the CIA and, uh, you know, was going to, going to make that transition and, that I knew was blown. So at the time, I was kind of like, shit, that was kind of my career path here. Yeah. Now this, now I got to go talk to cameras, you know, and what I'm, and that was what amazed me. And then September 11th hit, you know, we, we did all this whirlwind tour and there was all this attention. And I, I just, I was back flying three weeks later. I made them put me back in the cockpit because that was the only thing that cleared my mind was getting back in the air. And so I'm flying, I'm an instructor, I'm doing the, you know, doing the speaking tour, that kind of stuff for the Navy and, you know, it's probably September 11th, so I was the, you know, the 15-minute the guy, right? And then the weekend, September 9th, I got invited back to Nebraska. Nebraska was playing Notre Dame for the first time in 30 years or 40, you know, and I got to do the coin toss on September 9th. Uh, wow. Got to bring my crew out. It was one of the best weekends of my life. Wow. Um, to say the least, I, it was so cool. So, I mean, you know, if you're a Husker, what, what better? And I, I flew home and I'll remember my mom because I was on the West Coast. My mom calling, waking me up, bawling and said, somebody hit the towers. I'm like, what are you talking about? And I thought it was just bad weather. You know, when I heard about the first one, I'm turning on the TV, watching it. And the second I saw the second one go in, I'd already spent over two years in the Middle East collecting intel. I knew who did it. I knew what it was. And I was getting ready to transfer out of my squad, and I went into my skipper, and I said, "You, I'm staying. We're going to have to figure out OPSEC, right? Because I was such a high-vis guy, you know, sending me over to the Middle East. There was They caught a couple crews filming me, you know, people filming me, trying to monitor me. And I'm sure they wanted my head on a platter. I'd have been a great trophy for them. But, you know, flying those first missions in to Afghanistan, I would have never forgiven myself if I wouldn't have been able to go. You know what I mean? It would have haunted me the rest of my life. And so I was, I flew over 300 combat hours in 32 days to kick that off. That's why. I mean, that is, it's stunning to me that after what you went through in Chinese captivity, really, I mean, there's no other way to say it, uh, right? Like, did they, did they, did you get like a, I guess, I don't think, did you get like a prisoner of war medal? Because they, they, you know, there, 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 there was talk of it and the politics said no. Yeah, because this wasn't a it wasn't like a, a war, right? Yeah. But it would qualify under it would it, it would it would technically qualify because of the duress we were under. They changed it after Iran, right? Because we weren't at war with Iran. Oh, right. All those people, you know. But I did. I don't. I'm not. I, I don't. I don't. Just don't give a shit about them. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, it, <laughs> it never could. I have pursued it. Yeah, but who cares? Well, right. I'm here. Yes. We all made it back. We did have. We did have one crewmate take his own life a couple years later. Sad deal. Um, the Navy really left him. It gave him some mental health issues. He had some issues and they literally, because he was struggling mentally, they took him and sent him to be a SEER trainer, teach POW training. What the hell? I, I don't know. Right? Yeah. He's struggling with the, And that's the last place you send the guy. And then he took his life. And his name's Brandon Funk. Uh, was a great guy. Guy. Brilliant. I don't even know how many languages that kid spoke. God. But sad deal. But we got everybody home, and that's the point. So the, the medals don't mean shit. No, they don't. They don't. And you learn that real quickly when you get home, that all the medals in the it's, world. It's I'm just happy to be here, Ribbons. Yeah. That's what I, I'm just happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because, wait, so you, you, got the, the, I, I, I like, you got the Distinguished Flying Cross. That's a huge deal. Yes. Like, that's... So that's yeah, at the time I was I was the only person flying in the Navy that had. One. Yeah. So like just to put it into perspective, like the Army awards the Distinguished Service Cross, which is like what like Major Winters got 
during World War II, uh, you know, that's the second highest o- award for valor or second highest award period in the whole country in the army. Is that the same for the Navy? Like the only thing higher is a medal of honor. It would be one. No, it would not. No, no. It'd be, it'd be one step below that, but it's still very high. I mean, it is. It, it was an honor to get it. The, the crew got air medals. I don't know. That was kind of bullshit, but whatever. Um, they, they wanted to give me the Navy cross, but it has, it can only be given during combat and we weren't at war with China. So that's why it was to the DFC, which is fine. I, I, like I said, I, I can't, uh, this, your story is unbelievable. I mean, do you, do you, do you struggle with some of the, I mean, I can't imagine going through eight days of, of torture and not waking up in the middle of the night sometimes and being like, you know, no. Yeah. And it's gotten better. I mean, you know, I'm about to turn 49 a long time ago and, and I've, I've really, I've really, I, I, these days for a lot of years, they, I mean, they call Simon's angry Osborne, right? I mean, I was definitely a guy and then they called me sugar later because they say I sugarcoat everything, which I do not, but I've really, I've really chilled out and there's, and, and I, and there's one, I, you know, I realized you can only control what you can control. So I'm, I'm a big Marcus Aurelius stoic fan. I, that's helped me find peace. And I just spend every day, at least a half hour reading the Bible. And it's brought me so much peace. I've always been a religious guy. Don't get me wrong. But later in life, I was struggling so much with the nightmares and the being pissed off about, you know, I still get a little jumpy. I definitely don't want fireworks going off behind me. You know, there's some things that aren't just going to go away, but I've really found a way to kind of, I guess that's my way of, of coping with it and, and just kind of letting go and realizing control everything. I think losing that Senate race helped me. That was a pretty big defeat for me when I lost. Um, just kind of realize, you know what? You're not you're not going to win everything you go after, right? Just just roll with it a little bit. I mean, in any sane world, and I can't tell you how many people that I've said this to on this show that have tried to run for office that that are freaking national heroes, and you you are one. I know that you probably hate to hear that, but I've I've never heard a story like yours. And you should have walked into a damn Senate seat. Uh, but, you know, I, I, like I know when I when I ran and I don't want to speak for you, Shane, but when I ran, like I went into it like wanting to make this country a better place, wanting to give our kids a country that's rich with opportunity, um, same country that we grew up in, only better. And you just realize how many terrible people on both sides of the aisle are in are in politics and. Uh, it's it it uh, really discourages you when you get a look behind the curtain and and look i i don't i don't know i don't even want to get into to trump or how people feel about trump but like what he he exposed that there really is a, a yes. swamp there and, and and it exists they're entrenched bureaucrats with very little life experience outside of the government and, and many of the elected officials these people, they love the title of being a member, or being a representative or a senator. They think it's cool. They like the authority that comes along with it and the power, but they're not there to to do a job. They're they're not there to make the world a better place. And that yeah. that is so concerning to me. And it's unfortunate that you know I learned that just trying to serve my country. Just how dirty and despicable some of these people are. Um, and yeah. it sounds like you had a similar experience. I mean, it's crazy. I did. I had, I did my last year. I, I, I got, I, I moved up to the Navy yard cause I, I had to have a bunch of surgeries, my shoulder, uh, my ankle, some other stuff. Right. So basically I was on my way out. I decided to get out. Um, you know, being that well known in the military at that low of a rank, being a new O three and, you know, you've literally got four stars calling you and asking you to come to speak. It just, I stayed in. Most people get out after something like that, right? They go out, they write the book, they get out. They came to me and said, will you write the book? The Navy did. And I said, only if I can stay in. (laughs) You know, it was just a different, I planned on staying in. I realized it wasn't going to work, right? Once I was out of my command and out of the people that knew me, I got just treated weird everywhere I went, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, your 06 doesn't want a famous 03 underneath him that's getting, he's getting calls from four stars saying, can he come this week and do this? It just doesn't work. It's not conducive to the military. Fine. Yeah. I got out. I could tell you this. My last year, I, I was in DC. So I knew I was kind of looking at politics a little bit, but I started getting to know a few of the congressmen 
right? Going going to the the Capitol Hill Club and you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. And I'll never forget having drinks at a table uh, with a, I won't name names, but I literally when they started telling my story to a congressman who didn't know the story, which, you know, this is like 2003, you know what I mean? It was like, like you're in Congress. Like, it's your job. To, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you didn't hear about this and that's fine. But I'm kind of like, and he goes, wait, you're in the Navy and you fly. And I said, yeah. And he goes, the Navy has airplanes. And I just, I stopped. It's a congressman asking me, he thought those were air force planes landing on the carrier like a congressman. And I went, holy shit, what's running our country? Uh, exactly. And I can tell you, I've only met a handful, and you know it, that are worth a shit. The rest of them, they're not good people. I don't care I, if they're R or D. I, I could not agree with you more. And, and like the, the good people that I know, and they're, they're there. They're, they're really they're there, great people. There's not they're, many. The, and, they're, and they're really great. Like, uh, uh, and I, lo- I love them dearly, but they're not many. There are not many, and I don't no. know what that says about the state of our country or what it means with regards to where we're headed, but like I said, in any sane world, a guy like you walks into the House of Representatives or walks into the Senate with no issues. It's just – it's a different yeah. – it feels it feels like it's a different time now. I don't know. I don't know, but it, – it, it does. It does. We're in, a, we're in a very, very vulnerable place in our country's history right now, and I think it's um, – you know, weakness invites that, and I'm not a hawk, but – Boy, I'm not either. I'm, I'm not sure either. about our future. I am not a hawk by any stretch. And uh, I just, I don't like where we're going, where we're at. And, you know, um, you know, this not, not to get political, but seeing what, what we're doing to a former president, I don't care what side of the aisle. You're on. I completely Everybody agree. This is bullshit. It's bullshit. Everybody. It's everybody. Absolutely everybody. And everybody not, outside of yourself. Everybody outside of D.C. and New York City knows it's complete bullshit or they're yeah. they're on the hard left and they don't want to they don't want to they, they're just glad they're living in it. denial. They're just yeah, like, yeah they don't yeah. they don't care. They're, they're win they're win at all costs type folks. And there's some on the right, too, that'll do that type of stuff. But right now, what you're seeing is this isn't good for our country. And, and to your point and, about and we've got some I, Republicans showing their true colors, right? Yes. By not yes. even calling it out. Absolutely right. And, and it's like, it's, it's, this is the number one thing that when you talk to people, uh, when I was running campaigns, they just want someone who's willing to fight for them. That's it. That's the number one quality that they want. It doesn't mean that you're going to agree with them on everything. They just want somebody who's going to be honest and somebody who's going to fight. And you talked about not being a hawk. And I think there's, for me, having gone through what I went through in, co- in direct combat with an enemy of the United States and gone through what you went through, it's hard to come out of that. And, and and want to put others p- through it potentially, you know? And so that's what yes. I, 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 I can't in good conscience uh, embrace uh, what, what they would call today, like a neoconservative hawkish mentality on foreign policy. And this idea that we should be Agreed. fighting wars everywhere. Like it, it's just like having been through what I've been through, like we, that should be a, a last resort, but it doesn't seem like it's a last resort to many of the leaders that we have in Washington. It's just that they just want to go, go, go and figure out the mission in the end state after. And I just can't get on board with something like that. No, we've got no business. We get, we've got our own problems to take care of. I, I completely our, agree on issues that we're not addressing here. And, and, uh, uh, we're, we're going to get our, we're going to get ourselves in a, in a real bad place. And, uh, you know, we took the eye off of China for 20 years what I, in the hell. You know, I know. It's like, what are you talking about? Uh, I, I completely agree. I, I completely agree with you. And I just feel like, man, I, I've already kept you for an hour and 15 minutes. I don't want to keep you anymore, <laughs> but you got to promise me that you come back here and talk with me more. I mean, yeah, I, sure. I, I, hey, I appreciate you having it. It was, it was fun. I, I enjoyed I, it. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's always, a, it's always good to have a good conversation with some uh, like-minded people. I mean, next time you're in Pittsburgh or I'm down in Florida or wherever the hell our paths cross a beers are on me because man, you deserve it. I, I'm, and, in, and Omaha, so, I'm in Omaha most of the time, but I am down in Florida on occasion. <laughs> Well, hey, I, you know, if I'm ever in Omaha, if I'm ever in Nebraska, like I said, <laughs> drinks on me. I, but no, like, I'd, RW, I'd, love to, I'd love to meet you. RWH Energy is 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 your company. Tell tell us yep. what you're up to now, and we've oh, got sure. lots that, of energy just, folks who tune into this. We're, yeah, we're a Department of Energy Energy Services company. We're 100 percent 
disabled veteran owned, um, hire a lot of, you know, disabled vets, work with a lot of other veteran firms at least. Um, and we build microgrids and do energy efficiency. So um, help bring resiliency uh, to people that need power critically, you know, do like a- anything as simple as like an LED upgrade for campuses and and large commercial industrial. And so we bring the capital with it. It's, it's pretty cool. It's a, there's a website, rwhenergy.com and and uh, things are things are good, but we do everything that makes economic sense. Um, it's not just a, a green energy sort of speak company. It's more of an energy efficiency and resiliency company. I love it. I love it. And also an extraordinarily important mission. You know, our grid is so vulnerable in so many different ways, but that's a conversation oh. for for another time. I, I I feel like. I hope that you stay in the fight politically, even if it's even if it's like not directly involved. I, but this country needs people like you now more than ever, Shane. And and thank you for giving us your time today. Thank you. Hey, for coming thank you on for the your show. service, and I appreciate you having me. This is awesome. Any anytime, man. Anytime. God bless you, and, and All right. like God, God bless, bless your service, right. man. Thanks, brother. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, that was Shane Osborne. I have been in some ridiculously terrible life and death situations before in my life. Really, really bad spots. I've never heard a story like Shane's before. So I I hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Um, Like I said to you, uh, like I say to you at the end of every episode, like we have some amazing things coming. I'm so excited to share them with you. Um, This show isn't anything without you, the audience. It's for you. Uh, We work hard every week to improve bit by bit just to make the show better for you. So as always, thank you all so much for watching. You know, subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts, Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, But we're really migrating over to Rumble right now because YouTube, like why spend all the time, money, investment, Uh, and building a YouTube channel when they can just suspend you (laughs) at the drop of a hat. So we're migrating over to Rumble uh, so you can watch everything there. You get tons of exclusive content. So subscribe to my channel, Sean Parnell or Sean Parnell Battleground, both are the same. Uh, Go to the website, officialseanparnell.com. We've got signed copies of all of my books on there from Out Level Tomb, Man of War, All Out War, One True Patriot, Left for Dead. They're all there. Um, and we're also rolling out Battleground Apparel. So officialseanparnell.com. Check it out. Uh, and anytime you need anything from me, just write me on my social media, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. I, I typically respond. We get lots of messages, but I try to respond to every single one. And as always, God bless you all. And God bless this exceptional nation that we live in. Take care. Take care.